coming up on this week's mini episode of the Broken Brain Podcast. Sexual health and sexual function, having a, a happy, successful, you know, um, pleasurable sex life actually impacts all six areas of health. Um, and it's also impacted by all six areas of health. So it kind of goes both ways. Hi, everyone. Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. We're back with another mini episode. And today's title is How to Biohack your sexual pleasure. Shout out to my team members, Melanie and Patrick, for putting this mini episode together. You guys love them. They're the ones that put it together. Super appreciate my team. Let's jump in. Did you know that being sexually active is associated with closer relationships, better immune function, lower blood pressure, improved sleep, reduced stress, and even lower mortality? In this mini episode, I speak with Dr. Amy Killen, Alyssa Vitti and Dr. Stephanie Estima about the importance of sexual pleasure to our well-being, how sex drive and orgasmic response changes a woman's cycle, and why orgasms should be part of our self-care regimen. Spicy topics. Let's listen in, starting with my interview with Dr. Amy Killen, an anti-aging and regenerative physician specializing in sexual optimization, aesthetics, and longevity medicine. How important is sexual pleasure and sexual health for our overall health what do we get from it so we get we get so many things um it's it's basically important for all aspects of health when i talk about health i look at like the sort of six main components of health so you have physical health and i can we'll talk about kind of some specific things with that and there's there's spiritual health there's emotional health there's mental health there's uh environmental health and there's social health so those are kind of the six sort of main types of health or parts of health that are important and sexual health and sexual function having a, a happy successful you know um, pleasurable sex life actually impacts all six areas of health um, and it's also impacted by all six areas of health so it kind of goes both ways um, so for instance for cognitive health we know that people who have active healthy sex lives and usually active is defined as something in the realm of maybe once a week having sex or certainly a couple of times a month it depends on the studies but it's not like every day it's just you know it's something that's generally a part of their lives um, those people tend to have less cognitive decline as they get older. They've done studies with, um, with women and men, uh, but basically looked at women who had, you know, were having sex versus women who had not uh, been having you know, regular active sex. And the ones who were sexually active um, had better cognition. They had less cognitive decline as they got older, which is interesting. They've done look, they looked at the hippocampus and basically people who were more sexually active uh, tend to have sort of larger, healthier hippocampuses, which is you know, tied to memory and things like that. Um, so it's tied very much to cognitive health. Uh, sex is definitely tied to mental sort of emotional health and that we know that people who, uh, again, have sort of active, healthy sex lives tend to have less anxiety. They tend to have, you know, they feel better about themselves and have better um, sort of self, you know, they, their self What's the word? Self-esteem. Yeah, that word. Like, I was like, um, they'd have higher self-esteem. They still have less anxiety. They sleep better, uh, which of course we know sleep has its own whole other, you know, the benefits of sleep are, we could talk, you know, for about half a day about that. So it helps with sleep. It helps with anxiety. It helps with self-image. Um, and other, lots of other things like like less depression. People are, who are generally having a lot of sex have less depression. So all of that's very important. From a physical standpoint, we know that people who are sexually active tend to have lower blood pressure. Um, they tend to, again, sleep better, which is really important. They tend to have less cardiovascular disease. Uh, there was one study in men, again, who looked at men over a 10-year period of time, men who were having sex at least once a week, I believe. And it, it, at the end of it, they showed that there was actually a 50% reduction in overall mortality in the men who were having regular sex versus the men who were not. Now, there's several things probably tied to that. I mean, you can't just say it's just sex. I mean, maybe they're just more active in general or, you know, they have a better relationship with their partner, et cetera. So, but, but these are pretty big things to, you know, to talk about and to think about. Um, and it's besides, you know, sex is fun, but it also does all this really good stuff for us. A woman's hormonal landscape changes dramatically throughout her life. Because of this unique biology, understanding her menstrual cycle and its rhythm can be incredibly useful for optimizing productivity, weight, sexual drive, energy, mood, and so much more. Alyssa Vitti, a pioneering female biohacker and women's hormone and functional nutrition expert and, by the way, best-selling author of Woman Code, and in the flow talks to us about how for women the best path to an orgasm changes depending on which phase of her cycle she happens to be in and what's happening with her 
hormones. She also shares great tips for couples who have children or who are new parents and the importance of communication and regularly scheduling time for physical intimacy. Let's listen in. And one of the ones that you had mentioned in is sex and intimacy. Yes. So let's talk about how that plays into the rhythm. So as I mentioned before, 60% of women are sexually unsatisfied, which is a ridiculous amount of women. This is not good. You know, we talk about when women are happy, you know, other people are happy. I mean, I think this is a great place for women to just get some agency because it's a very simple fix. The reason why women are, are I think, unnecessarily unsatisfied is because they are not aware of the fact that they have real physical, physiological changes across their libido and orgasmic response across the infradian cycle, right? So that means you'll have times when you're naturally less self-lubricating. You'll have times where you need more clitoral stimulation to achieve not only the orgasmic plateau, but also climax, right? You'll have times in the cycle where you'll need more emotional connection before the physical connection. This is not just like shots in the dark of, oh, I wonder why last week was fireworks with my partner and this week was like a ho-hum, right? And this, and, and women, because we've been deprived of all this information, right, it's the same continuum of the conversation. When the diet doesn't work, we think that inner critical voice steps in and it's like, oh, it's my fault. I failed. Something's wrong with me. I lack discipline. I lack willpower. When the fitness plan doesn't work, we don't question the plan. We, we question ourselves. We criticize ourselves. When our sex life isn't going the way that we would like it to when we're 60% of us, to, to be exact, are not fulfilled sexually. Um, we think there's something wrong with our libido. And if I could add something to that, yeah, the times where it's working and then the next week it's not working and then you think you're even crazier because it's not just not working once, but it might work, as you were saying earlier, in one it phase. It feels random. It feels random. And it's not random. That's the thing. It's predictable. You can plan on it. That's what the scheduler is for. So, so it's really exciting to be able to just educate women. This is chapter eight of the book. Um, you have phases where you're more dry, where you must add lubricant. You must add outside lubricant, right? Um, and phases where you don't need any, right? You have phases where you need more stimulation. You have phases where you will achieve the same orgasmic plateau and climax with less stimulation. And just knowing when that is happening is really empowering to you because now nothing's wrong with you at all. You just need to work with what's going on. A perfectly designed system. Exactly. exactly the way nature intended. Exactly. Just like men, right? So for example, you make all this testosterone at night. It is optimal for you to be having sex earlier in the day. And anybody, any man who's had... You wake up knowing that with a punctuation <laughs> mark, okay? Uh, an exclamation point. Um, and men prefer not to have or to be approached for sex later in the evening because they're exhausted and they're out of testosterone and it drains your energy. Like, did you ever notice you pass out after intercourse at night but not in the morning? All the time. I will add the benefit that I have the pleasure of interviewing incredible <laughs> teachers like yourself yes. on this podcast. So there's a little bit of awareness, but yes. Right. So knowing that it isn't because men always fall asleep after they have intercourse. It's because they're doing it at night when they're completely out of cortisol. Now they're draining more cortisol and they're out of testosterone. They've got, they're, you're literally doing it on fumes, right? Suboptimal sexual experience for you to do it that late at night. This is not like personal or you know it's it's just a fact this is just how your biology works the same is true for women there's a way our biology works there's a way you have your sexual energy work across the infradian cycle it's a fact you can ignore you can choose to ignore it and go against it but your experience like men at night will be less pleasurable and you should expect that not be surprised by it or caught off guard or start to criticize yourself and same is true for men if any man is thinking gee what's wrong with me at night i don't want to have as much intercourse with my partner or i feel tired or i can't have the response that i want to have do not inner do go into that inner critical voice this is your biology at play you need to go to sleep and listen to your body and make more testosterone and try again in the morning and you'll find you'll have a very different experience so i want you to throw out a little teaser there's a lot of parents. Wasn't that, that a tease? That was great. <laughs> and we're going to build on that. Sure. There's a lot of parents that listen to this podcast. The audience is mostly women, but there are men that listen to this podcast too. And one of the things that you see often 
anecdotally, and I think there's some evidence behind this too, is that couples have kids and intimacy kind of plummets to the ground. I have a kid. I have a husband. Let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And part of that is the scheduling of intimacy and the you know constraints of raising kids and doing that. I don't have kids, but I just talk to my friends sure. and we have honest conversations around it. And so what would be an example for a couple that has just recently had kids and now they're not having intimacy as much and they're trying to match up their schedules, how men can better understand women. And you kind of talked about how women can better understand men, I that ideal. It, I think it's great to understand each other. If you're in a heterosexual relationship yeah. or if you're in a same sex relationship, you should seek to not only be self-aware, but aware of your partner's patterns and needs too, because that's part of loving your partner. It's a huge part of it. It's a huge gift. That's why I put partner sync, by the way, into the MyFlow app so that you could make your partner psychic so to speak. I put that in air quotes because um, isn't it nice to be able to just give your partner this information, right? So for example, any woman who's using the app can download her partner's email address into the partner sync and then he or she will be given a hormonal dossier of where you are in your infradian cycle, your hormonal pattern, and it'll tell them, you know, these would be ideal activities to do to build emotional intimacy and here's how to optimize physical intimacy. And that changes across the cycle. So you have a recipe for success as the partner and the receiver, your partner, the woman who has the app, will feel her needs being so met by you. And so, you know, it just reduces a lot of unnecessary conflict because you're you're using information and facts to your advantage in the relationship, which is what, one of the things I talk about in that chapter. Um, but yes, when you have kids, you have to also factor in the different stages of having children. So there's like the infancy newborn stage, nobody's having sex and that is okay because <laughs> women have a three month postpartum period that must be honored for her to have long-term health. You have to recover in an appropriate way. You must not be cycle thinking during this phase. You must be eating in a very particular way for postpartum for three months. You must be resting and remineralizing the body. And remember everyone, whoever is involved in having the child, that the person who carried it, we talk about, we get all excited about 3D printing literally women 3D print hu f human beings. Do you know how many micronutrients, omega-3 fatty acids, blood, white blood, everything goes into doing that? To then have an expectation that she should be jumping around, doing a bunch of things, and also be interested in having sex is unrealistic and not biologically appropriate. So we have to have a better understanding of the postpartum period so that expectations are level set so that no one's upset about what's happening with sex. And also typically men or women who are having the child with the woman who's had, who made the baby is also exhausted because the baby's waking everybody up mm -hmm. in the middle of the night all the time because their blood sugar can't stabilize for several months and they have to feed very regularly and that's just part of their development. So then once you sort of cross into the six month mark, things start to stabilize out with nap schedules and then it becomes very easy for people to start to reconnect physically because nap schedules can be so predictable. Things just, and this is where knowing about where you are in your phase can be really helpful if your period has returned because then you can say, okay, we have half an hour. I'm in a phase where I know I need lubricant. Let's not waste any time. We need more stimulation. Let's do the things that are gonna achieve the results that we want. So you may think, oh, gee, that's taking some of the romance out of it. But that is one of the things that I think Esther Perel talks really well about mating in captivity in her wonderful book. When you're in a partnership like that and you've taken on parenting, um, part of what becomes romantic is those uh, that attention to those types of details. Like I care enough about you and your pleasure to take that all into consideration in making the recipe for the meal tonight, whatever that is, our physical intimacy meal, right? Instead of just being focused on, am I getting my needs met? Where are we meeting our needs together? It just becomes a different game. We're playing a different game together. And then as the kid gets older, like I have a five-year-old, right? So we like to plan things during our optimal time, which is more of a daytime activity. So we have to schedule that really creatively because nights during the week, can be very late and exhausting and neither one of us have energy for maybe full nights of activity. So we do a couple of things. We'll either schedule um, mini sessions during the week where we may not do everything that we can do, but we'll do some things that give us that sense of physical intimacy. And then when we can during the day have a more drawn out session 
we maybe drop the kid off for a play date or we do things, we get creative to have some time alone carved out where we can just be physically together without any of the constraints of that. And you have to, you have to coordinate that and you have to schedule that. Yeah, coordination is like really the key and that can happen when there's awareness. And it's a good practice because not only do you have these lifestyle changes when you have children, but then when men and women or women and women go through andropause and menopause, and perimenopause for that matter, andropause starts at 25 for men, perimenopause starts at 35 for women, and then everybody becomes post-menopausal or post you know, there's not actually a word for it, but men do get downshift into a, a lower state of testosterone, you know, after 65. So um, when you're, when everybody, you have to, you have to be sensitive to each other's changing biology. You might meet when everybody's young and full of energy, but as you stay together as a couple, your biochemistry changes, what you need changes, and actually practicing the cycle syncing method in your four phases of your cycle sets you up to really have the the self-awareness, the partner awareness, to really navigate these life stage changes as you go through them. And I actually think this is so important um, that there's a whole section just describing these different life stages, how to really navigate them with yourself and with your partner. Because I think we could do more, like biohacking our entire lives, biohacking our relationships, to set those up for more success too with this type of awareness. It's not breaking news to say that orgasms feel incredible but did you know that they are also pretty good for you and good for your health it's true which is probably why we should be having more of them whether with a partner or solo my good friend dr stephanie estima a chiropractor and expert in female metabolism and body composition shares with us the many health benefits of having regular orgasms and her seven day orgasm challenge what is it stay tuned just to kind of circle back on the orgasms and the sex and the pleasure, that is such a big uh, area when, you know, even if we just want to stay above the head and say, listen, it's going to promote BDNF, it's going to promote healthy brain aging, it's going to reduce your cortisol, get you in a parasympathetic state. You know, even if we just kind of want to talk about these sort of, you know, once or twice removed constructs around the orgasm uh, for women, so important. Um, I actually... Um, I was saying to you, like, you know, I'm writing a book. I'm not quite ready to kind of talk about it, but one part of the book is like all about orgasms. And um, one of the things that, uh, like, I'll just share with you and your audience now is taking like a seven day orgasm challenge. Like, take a picture of your face before, and then for seven days with either, you know, your partner or, you know, get a toy and call it your partner and then just get after the orgasm. Like you have an orgasm every day and take a picture in seven days and tell me how different your face looks. Like you will have, like your face will be glowy. You'll be happier. Um, having orgasms is something that should be part of everybody's um, self-care regimen, especially women. And it's like, you know, there's been some debate around like for men, how many should they have and the testosterone and the um, you know, how they can become more estrogenergic after an orgasm. But for women, it's like as many as you can get, ladies, like as many times that you can climax um, that you can is going to impart some of the brain benefits, but you're also just going to feel great. And I think one of the things with women is that we can actually forget about sex if we're not having it. So if you are not having regular orgasms, you're not going to think about having more orgasms. So it's something that I think is really, really important for um, a woman to not only, you know, use toys, but um, I, I, I'm a big fan of actually having a woman discover what actually turns her on with her own hands, because that is going to allow her to communicate to her partner, uh, if there is one, um, what, uh, what she likes. A healthy sex life is an important part of our overall health. When we have a better understanding of what our bodies need to feel their best, we also have the knowledge we need to boost libido and have more pleasurable sexual life and overall health. Thank you for tuning into this mini episode of the Broken Brain Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Give some love to our featured guest in today's episode, Dr. Amy Killen, Alyssa Vitti, and my dear friend, Dr. Stephanie Estima. You can find their social handles in the show notes, and you can listen to their full episodes in the show notes as well. Stay tuned for next week. Talk to you soon.